If you have your Bibles this evening, we're going to look at two passages. We're going to be looking at Matthew 2 and Luke chapter 2, very familiar uh, text, and we're going to just quickly look at three ideas uh, going along with a Christmas theme. In Matthew chapter 2, uh, in verses 1 through 12, we won't read all of them. In verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. In verse 3, it says, And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And we see uh, that in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, this is verse 8, and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And then we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, we know, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So that's the setting uh, that uh, there was a, a taxing. And so then we know that Mary and Joseph then had to uh, take a journey from Nazareth, and that's found in verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed uh, with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. This evening, we're just going to take just a few moments uh, and consider three simple thoughts. Because maybe you've uh, tried to get directions before, maybe you've been out and uh, you were at a, at a gas station, grocery store, you're out traveling, and, or maybe you're in a store and someone says, hey, it's right around the corner, you can't miss it. As sure as the world, a half hour later, an hour later, um, we've heard those words, you can't miss it, but actually you still did. You missed it. It is possible to miss something even when it's right in front of your face. And some of us, that's happened. Sometimes you're looking for something and you're like, you know what, I know I placed it right here, and somebody else will come right up and say, well, it's right there. You've missed it, even though it's right in front of you. And did you know that most people, I believe, miss Christmas every year? They miss it every year. They, that may sound like a, a ridiculous statement. It may sound just silly and say, there's no way. I mean, in America, how could anybody miss Christmas? They start the uh, marathon of um, music. You know, the rock and roll music stations start up their marathon, I think, after Labor Day. All right, and they're like, hey, you know, especially, and, and this year they wanted to even go earlier, so I think it was after July 4th, and they're like, you know, this year we especially need joy. All right, so let's, let's kick in rock around the Christmas tree. All right, that'll bring joy. Uh, actually, it brings heartburn and headaches and things like that. But with holiday advertisements, um, all kinds of other things that bombard us, uh, basically starting uh, in October, saying Christmas is coming, you'd say there's no way that people could miss Christmas, and yet many folks who participate in Christmas celebrations, even this next week, are oblivious to the true reality of what they are celebrating. They participate in a lot of activities. They even may grace a church service. We may have, have some that you've, you come tonight and you say, man, I, I want to get in a Christmas concert. 
But in some ways, you've missed the whole point of Christmas because the main event was Jesus Christ. That was the main point of Christmas. And I think uh, there are folks that are unsaved that miss it. But there are also people that are saved that still miss it. They don't get it. There are some that don't understand that Christ came to change us, to make us different, not to make us like the world. And that's what, I, over and over, it, it amazes me. Some people that are saved and they think, oh, I'm going to get this person to come to church by being a dude. No, you've missed it. Christ didn't come to save your soul so you could be like the world. No, that's not why he saved you. He saved you so that you could be a new creation. Yes, and I do a Bible to back up what I say. And most people, what I find, that love the world and they want the world and they've missed the point of Christ coming into the world, they twist scripture, they say they love Christ, but they don't even know what love is. They don't even understand it. They have a worldly concept of love. And so this evening, just three simple points with the idea that you can miss it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless as we consider just a few thoughts. Give us wisdom, direction. I pray that the Word of God can do its work. Do that which I cannot do, and that is speak to hearts. We ask and claim your power in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this passage in chapter 2, we're not given the name. We're not given the name, but in verse 7, we are indicated that there is an innkeeper. Notice, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, and most know that that is a place uh, where animals were kept because there was no room for them in the inn. And we just recently, I, I believe uh, Pastor Malinak was talking about it uh, on our Christmas banquet. He was talking about the, the idea of the, the Christmas uh, in or the end, and sometimes we think of like a holiday inn and you're, you're, you're stepping into the lobby and there's chandeliers and there's a big tree in the background. Well, no, 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 that's not what it was like in Bethlehem. But there still was no room in the end. And so here we have an innkeeper that missed it. He missed it. Here was Jesus being born and he missed it. And so, my first point is we can miss it by being preoccupied. Maybe it was that there was a whole bunch of people coming in, and that's more than likely what happened. The idea of the taxing was that there was going to be traveling all over the nation of Israel. There was going to be people uh, going here and there and all over the place, and they were going to be uh, going uh, from this town to this town. There was going to be uh, gathering the family together, maybe traveling in caravans to different places. And so this man was thinking, hey, I I've got to get my place together. There's going to be a lot of people, and yet there wasn't any room for Mary and Joseph and their newborn babe. He was preoccupied. Scripture, as I said, doesn't mention the name of the innkeeper. It doesn't mention the name of the inn. But the innkeeper made a decision. Standing before him was a man and his pregnant wife, and he was preoccupied with other things. And that can happen for us. We can be preoccupied with other things, and that makes us miss Christ, the newborn king. You can be preoccupied. Now, you may be here tonight and you came in and you'd say, you know what, that, that was great music and that's all I was here for. I didn't know they tricked me. I didn't know they were going to open up the Bible and have some guy yell at me. All right? And you'd say, just, just shut it down. But it may be that you get preoccupied with all the other things at Christmas time and yet you forget that Jesus Christ came to redeem us. And that may be you this evening. You came and, and you say, well, where Christmas is, is about friends. Actually, it's not. And I have scripture to show that. Christmas isn't necessarily about family. All right? And some of you are like, oh, wait a minute. It's not about gifts. Christmas is about Christ. That's what it's about. And it amazes me that some people, even a, some people that are saved, and I'm talking to church folks here, on Christmas Day, 
Will you even take an extra 10 minutes to read a little bit of scripture? Oh, man, that's my day off. And yet, your sorry soul wouldn't be saved if Christ didn't come. Here is the innkeeper, and he was preoccupied. And I think many times we are preoccupied with all kinds of other things, and we miss the point of Christmas. We miss the point of Christ coming to this world. He came uh, to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. That means every one of us here sitting in this room at some point was lost. Now, some of us have been found, and praise the Lord for that. But some, man, you've been found, but it's like you're lost again. Why? Because Jesus Christ came to save us. And don't be preoccupied with all kinds of other things and forget the point of Jesus coming to this earth. We can be preoccupied. But then notice we're going to go back to the text we read in Matthew 2. In Matthew chapter 2. And we have two groups of people that we see here that missed it. First is King Herod. Notice in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and we read this already, there was um, Herod the king, and he heard about these wise men from the east, and, and they were saying, where is, he was saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. This is the wise men in the east. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, part of it, if you've studied a little bit of history, Herod was crazy. He was cracked, all right? He had uh, not only killed a wife or two, all right? He had killed uh, some of his own uh, sons or daughters. Anybody that threatened King Herod, they were, uh, they were going to be ousted and more than likely killed. He was, he was somebody that... Um, you didn't want to whisper, hey, I wonder if I could be king. You, don't, you did not want to say that around King Herod because you would be dead within maybe an hour or two. King Herod uh, was troubled. Why? He missed it through fear. That's what he missed it through. He was fearful of this new king. That's, what it, that, that's the idea of troubled. He was fearful. And here is another king of the Jews. What, what are you talking about, a king of the Jews? I'm the king of the Jews. This is, this is, this is my kingdom. King Herod knew all the facts. Verse 3 tells us that King Herod was disturbed with the news. He didn't want, uh, or didn't want someone else to be the king of the Jews. King Herod was fearful of what he might lose because of the Christ child. And this makes me think of some folks that are unsaved and they're fearful of accepting Christ because of what you may lose. Satan whispers that to you. He says, oh, you know what? You're going to lose your friends. You're going to lose monetary gain. You're going to lose status in this world. However, through Christ and only Christ can you have eternal gain. You can only have heaven and your sins paid for through this Christ child. And in fear sometimes, somebody that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, they are held off because Satan uses fear. If we haven't learned anything this year, all right, this world, and I believe the devil, loves using fear. Fear. To cripple people, to freeze people up. And what's amazing is through Christ, you're released from that. Remember, Paul, writing to Timothy, said that he hasn't given us the spirit of what? Fear. But that's through Christ that that's busted. Through Christ that is released. And I think also that Christ to Christians sometimes threatens, uh, threatens, and threatens us, and especially as a, as a worldly Christian. 
As a worldly Christian, sometimes you look at the Christ child and you miss it. And you'd say, well, how are you going to miss it? Because you're fearful of what you're going to lose if you give in to Christ. And the devil comes and whispers to you, hey, you know what? You're not going to be, you're not going to be so cool. Well, let me look it up tonight. Not right now, but look up Carl Lentz. Look up Carl Lentz. Just, just look him up. I've always, uh, um, the, the staff knows it, we, you know, we re research and we keep, uh, I'm not saying we follow guys, uh, but I want to I kind of keep, uh, keep current in the, the local dude pastors in America. Carl Lentz was one of them. He led the biggest, one of the biggest churches, dude churches in New York City. He was Justin Bieber's pastor. All right, uh, he, got, he got him saved, baptized, and a whole bunch of other celebrities. But what's amazing is that uh, Justin Bieber actually seemed to be more saved than his pastor because he'd be hanging out at bars with uh, Bieber, and the pastor almost always had his shirt off. All right, I don't know why. I, I guess uh, when you're at a bar, your shirt comes off. All right? But this is what's amazing. Just a couple weeks ago, they fired him. You know why? Multiple affairs. Because dude, man, yeah. You can read, art I read articles on it. They said he, they, he'd be bringing women backstage. That's why we preach against the world. That's why we preach hard against the world. Because you think, oh, no, it's not going to do that. But some of you, what you don't understand is the world will bring you ruin. That's what it brings. It brings shame. And now he has to, oh, you know, I'm sorry, and my wife and, and my kids. You know what? You're a disgrace, and you're a disgrace to Christ. But Satan whispered to Carl Lentz, don't be so rigid. Be the dude pastor. You know what? You're going to lose something if you, if you follow the scriptures so rigidly. Maybe he should have. And as a Christian, that's my challenge to you. Because the devil whispers to you, hey, you're going to lose out. That's, that's the spirit of King Herod. King Herod missed out in understanding the Christ child because he was fearful of what he would lose. And it could be that you're unsaved and the devil's whispering to you that you're going to lose something if you trust in Christ. No, you'll gain eternal heaven. That's what you'll gain. But you keep, you, you keep what you have, as we said this morning, without making a decision for Christ when we're born into this world. The Bible says we're condemned already. We're born into this world condemned. The third thing is found in this text too. Notice in verse 4, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Look at verse 5. They said unto them, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So there's a, a third group that missed it. All right, the, the first we saw uh, was somebody that was preoccupied. That was an innkeeper. The second that missed it was King Herod. And the third is religion. Missed it through religion. Did you notice that this was the chief priest and the scribes? I've met some people that can spout scripture in some ways and they can talk a little bit in religiosity, if that's a word. They can talk a little bit in the philosophy of different religions, but yet they've missed it. And that's what we see here in this passage. Here are the chief priests, and here are the scribes, and the scribes are the folks, if you study a little bit about the scribes, they were responsible for copying the scriptures down, and they were tedious about it. I don't think you and I would have the King James, uh, if, if we were responsible for the preservation of the King James and it was handwritten and you had to follow the scribes, we'd be like, forget it. 
But the scribes were tedious. It was, it was, uh, it was unbelievable what they went through to keep the scriptures preserved for the Hebrew people. So they were intense on keeping the word of God, the words of God, the Pentateuch, for the children of Israel. They knew tons of scriptures. In fact, when King Herod came to the religious crowd and he was like, hey, you know what? These wise men are saying that there's some king of the Jews. They're like, oh, yeah, it's going to be in Bethlehem. Right away they knew it. But did they go? No. It didn't move them to action. So what does that tell you about this religious crowd? They had a head knowledge, but no heart knowledge. And I would venture to say that there's some sitting here that you have a head knowledge of Scripture, but it hasn't reached, as they say, what is that, 10 inches or something like that? You're 10 inches, 10 inches away from heaven because it has to hit here. It has. It has to be the heart that calls out to God in salvation. You can miss it. You can miss it by going to church and doing good works and doing all kinds of things. And that was the chief priests and the scribes, the Pharisees. Man, they were filled up with goodness as far as good deeds. But Christ, when he was here on this earth, he scolded them. There was nobody that could uh, tee it up as far as for Jesus Christ. There was nobody that Jesus would get a, a little... A uh, hot under the collar more than against the Pharisees. He would call them whited sepulchers. And you might not understand what a whited sepulcher was, but what it was is it was a painted tomb. A painted tomb. And he, and he even said it, and you're filled up with dead men's bones. Just so you know, that wasn't a compliment. He also called them vipers. So Snakes. It wasn't compliments. He didn't have a lot of good to say for people that basically thought they were going to get to heaven by doing a bunch of good works. Because that's not how you get to heaven. You get to heaven by trusting only in Jesus Christ. That's why the Christ child came. Many a person knows the right answers, but their heart is far from letting this Christ child be their master. This evening, maybe it is in your life. There's three people that missed it. The innkeeper, King Herod, and a religious crowd. They all missed the point of Christ's coming. And maybe you missed it. Maybe you're not saved. You don't know Christ as your Savior. Then tonight, I challenge you to accept Christ as your Savior. Put your faith not in the babe in the manger, but as we discussed this morning, as the master in the manger. All right, he became, he is worthy to be your master and Lord and Savior. That's what he's worthy to be. And it could be that as a Christian this evening, boy, you get caught up in a whole bunch of things, but you're missing the point of Christ coming to this earth. During World War II, General Dwight Eisenhower was in Europe he was directing the planning of the D-Day invasion. During this time that he was uh, planning and a, a bunch of people were coming together, uh, different nations, and they had to uh, spend a lot of time coordinating this plan. It was during this intense time of preparation that word came to General Eisenhower that his father had passed away. What was he to do? At that moment, it was impossible for General Eisenhower to leave Europe and come back to the States. He had to finish this plan. But he said, I, I've got to do something. So he told everybody to leave him alone for 30 minutes. They all left and he shut the door. He pulled out his journal and he took 30 minutes to just sit and think about what his father meant to him and how he had shaped him and the different things that his father had done for him. They all came back in after 30 minutes, and he started back into the planning. 
They got done a little bit earlier, and he was able to slip out of his office a little early on that day, and he went home, and again, he spent that whole evening just thinking about what his father had meant to him. And I thought about that. Here, he was a pretty busy guy. He had a lot. I mean, I don't think any of us have D-Day plans that we have to put together in the next day or so. But here, a general knew that it was very important to pause and to consider and to meditate and to think. Otherwise, he'd miss it. But how many of us forget? If a general planning D-Day could pause to re reflect on his father's life and impact on his life, can't we pause to consider what Christ's coming as our Savior means to us. There's a song that's in our hymn book. It's number 94. And the tune is an old tune. It's an old British tune called Green Sleeves. But most people, when they hear Green Sleeves, think of the song, What Child is this. What's interesting, the man who wrote it, William Chatter, uh, Chatter, uh, Chatterton Dix, was born in England. His father was a surgeon and wanted him to uh, follow in his footsteps, but he didn't like medicine. So he moved to Glasgow and he sold insurance. And as an insurance salesman, his greatest, one of his greatest loves was prose and poetry that he would write for Christ. And he wrote uh, a few, in fact, a couple of the Christmas songs, What Child Is This? and As With Gladness, Men of Old, we've sung that. He wrote both of those as poems. And this is the poem that he wrote. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem, th anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian, fear, for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Nails, spear shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. Raise, raise the song on high, the virgin sings her lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. Let's not miss the importance of the child who came to redeem us and to change us, to make us his children. Heads bowed eyes.